When you think of Italian culture, the first thing you probably think of is food. Tomato-based dishes, pizza, focaccia, limoncello, bolognese, or maybe even polenta, which is from my region of Italy, Friuli. But an important part of the long-standing cultural tradition of preparing these foods is the high quality and local ingredients used in Italian cooking. And in order to get those high quality ingredients, many Italians grow them. Growing your own food isn't a hobby, but a lifestyle in Italy. My grandparents, Italian immigrants who came over after the war, actually had two plots of land next to each other, one for their house and one for their garden. This is in Queens, New York. I have so many memories as a small child running through my grandparents' garden plot of meticulously strung tomatoes, vegetables that my nonni tended to, and the greenhouse that they kept to overwinter their plants. When I think of my Italian heritage, I think of the lineage of farmers and gardeners I come from. And frankly, I feel them living through me as I learn to grow my own tomatoes and produce. But the Italian connection to growing things runs far deeper than a happy tomato. In the 17th century, Italian gardeners were the innovators of ornamental gardens, highly architectural in nature, and also served as community spaces. I've only just begun to learn how interesting and layered Italian culture is when it comes to gardening. And a big part of my realization was reading the book, The Land Where Lemons Grow by Helena Attlee which you will hear me wax poetic about in a few minutes. But for the start of Italian and American Heritage Month, I'm so thrilled to welcome one of my most favorite authors of one of my most favorite books to the show to explore the rich history of Italians and growing things. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, welcome back to the podcast, plant friend. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. If you are a longtime listener of the podcast, you'll know that The Land Where Lemons Grow by Helena Atley is one of my favorite books. If you are a new listener to the podcast, welcome, plant friend. I'm Maria, the host of this podcast, an Italian-American happy plant lady. I used to kill plants. Now I have a thriving collection of indoor and outdoor plants, and it's my mission to help everyone care for plants successfully and cultivate their lives through doing so. I'm so excited for this episode celebrating Italian-American Heritage Month. I am proudly Italian-American. You might hear my bird chirping in the background. That's Frankie. A big part of me getting Frankie earlier this year was that the lineage of Italian women in my family has always had birds. So I felt like it was time for me to get a bird to kind of connect deeper to my lineage of Italian women in my bloodline. And when I garden, I feel my grandma with me, even though she is deceased. And we are so excited today to dive into the cultural connection between Italy and gardening. And a big part of the beginning of the exploration of this topic was reading The Land Where Lemons Grow by Helena Atley. It's one of my favorite books. It's always on my most recommended book lists. It's part history book, part plant care tutorial, part cookbook filled with surprising recipes that celebrate all sorts of citrus that you've never heard of. And it's all about the history of citrus in Italy and the surprising relevance it played in the country's economic history, social history. It's freaking fascinating. And as a plant person, I was so delighted to read this book because I love plants and I love citrus. So that was a natural connection, but also because of my Italian lineage. I have known that my passion for plants has run in my genes because I come from a lineage of Italian farmers. I grew up going to our farm in Friuli, Italy, and I've known that that innate connection between the land has run in my veins. But because I grew up in a suburban city in the United States outside of New York City, I was very disconnected from this part of my history. I was super plant blind. I couldn't keep a plant alive if someone paid me. And once I started learning to care for plants, it helped me reconnect to my lineage, but reconnect to this part of myself that was kind of lying dormant. Whether it's been caring for houseplants, whether it's been, you know, the small edible gardens that I've tended to over the last five years. I think there is a part of me, whether conscious or subconscious, that as I have become so lit up by, you know, caring for plants, there's also been this part of a reclamation of my Italian roots and a celebration of the Italian women in my family who, like my nonni, my grandma, who used to smuggle seeds back from Italy in her bra, <laughs> cooked her family nutritious meals almost 100% from food she grew. 
Because I've come to realize that joyfully cultivating plants is my birthright and it's your birthright too, whether or not you're Italian. But today's episode is going to celebrate the rich history of Italy and gardening. And, you know, as I've mentioned before, I've accidentally started this history series on the show, exploring the history of houseplants, the history of flowers. So now we're exploring the history of citrus through the lens of Italy with Helena Atley, an expert journalist, author, who has spent decades of her life studying Italian gardens, Italian culture, and how they intersect. We're so lucky to be joined by Helena today. I will let her introduce herself to you in this interview. And also, the week this episode airs, I'm headed to Italy for my two-year wedding anniversary with Billy. We're going part of the vacation with Mama Faella and Papa Faella. We're going truffle hunting in Asti. We're going to Milano. We're going to my house. I get to show Billy my house that I grew up visiting in Friuli, Italy. And then uh, we'll end our trip in Venice. But anyway, follow me on Instagram at Growing Joy with Maria for my Italian adventures if you're interested in that. I am very much hoping that I will be able to convince Billy to spend a half a day of one of the days that we're there visiting a historical citrus botanical garden. So fingers crossed we make it there. This is such a great conversation. So without further ado, I will let Helena introduce herself to you. Andiamo, amici. Helena, welcome to Growing Joy. I am so honored that you are taking the time to speak with me. Well, thank you. It's a delight to be here. (laughs) I've been a fan of yours since, I don't remember when I read The Land Where Lemons Grow. I think maybe it was 2019, maybe even 2018, but I was on a family beach vacation and I found your book and I just fell in love with citrus. I re-fell in love with my Italian heritage And I fell in love with you and your passion for Italian gardening and history and culinary. I mean, I've talked about your book on my podcast many times. It's always in my list of favorite books whenever I do a roundup. And the way that I like to describe your book is part history, part plant care, part cookbook, part memoir. I mean, it's such an interesting mix of passions And I'm so curious because I'm speaking to you and you have a beautiful English Welsh accent. You're not Italian to my eye. So I'm so curious, how did you become so passionate about Italian gardening? Well, really by chance, I studied Italian and English literature at university and then made a very strong connection with Italy then, went to live in Siena for a year when I was a student. And then five years later, I suppose six years later, after I was married and we just had our first baby and my husband, Alex Ramsey, who's a photographer, and I were commissioned to write and photograph a guidebook to Italian gardens. And this was really just because he was a photographer and I spoke Italian. We're talking about the end of the 80s. That sort of thing happened in the 80s, that sort of good fortune. And we went back to Italy. I mean, I had lots of friends in Siena. We based ourselves in Siena, but we spent a year uh, traveling with this very small baby and a tent, going to Italian gardens all over Italy. And it was a time when nobody was doing that. 1987, 1988, the last big book on Italian gardens was published in 1958 by Georgina Masson. And fantastic book, inspiring book. But it's all we had. That's all we had. And so we used that as our guidebook. It was a big Thames and Hudson picture book. And we would see that in Georgina Masson's book, it would say the such and such family have lived in this villa for 500 years. We'd go there. We'd get the local phone directory. I'd look them up. They'd still be there. I'd ring them up, Mm. you know, in the, in the telephone exchange in the middle of these little towns in, you know, really small places in Italy in the countryside. I'd ring them up and say, come and see your garden. And very often people would say, well, why do you want to do that? And I'd say, well, you know, your garden is one of the only examples of mannerist garden design. And, you know, that, and they say, oh, is it? Well, of course, you know, you come. 
and so we'd go. Right. Um, certo. <laughs> yeah. And of course, we had this little baby. I mean, she was very, very young. And very often we'd plonk her down in the garden. I'd run off with my notebook. Alex would run off with his camera. She was one of those babies who just sat. She didn't crawl, fortunately. But when we came back, very often the gardener or the gardener's wife would be playing with the baby and, you know, that would start a whole conversation. And so we became absolutely fascinated and in, sort of embedded in the history of Italian gardens and the state of historic gardens at the end of the 80s. They were very neglected. They were sort of on the cusp between beautifully romantic dishevelment and dereliction. It was a very extraordinary moment. Nobody was visiting them. The owners weren't exploiting them. They couldn't afford to look after them. You know, since the Second World War, there hadn't been enough money, really, to employ staff and buy water and do all the things that you needed to do to have a big garden in Italy. I mean, things have changed in the time I've known them enormously, but that's maybe I've talked enough. Wow. What a dream. Gosh. <laughs> I'm curious, is your daughter a gardener? Did that immersion stay with her? She was very little, but funnily enough, she now is living in Portugal where she's doing a sort of uh, restorative horticulture project, growing vegetables, selling them, you know, so somewhere maybe entered her wow. cells at some level. She was certainly looked after by a lot of very good gardeners in her first year. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So what does your garden look like? Where do you live and what does your personal garden look like? My permanent base is on the border between England and Wales. So while the rest of Europe is drying out, we still have plenty mm. of rainfall. And I've got a large garden, which is certainly influenced by 40 years of hanging out in Italian gardens. So I've got a large raised tank against a wall with water flowing into it and square beds in front of it. That's the main feature in the garden. Some bits of it are cultivated, some bits of it are, are wilder. Quite a lot of trees. I grow vegetables. It's very much part of my well-being is gardening. And I spent many, many years interviewing head gardeners all over the world in connection with books I was writing. And so I absorbed a lot about gardening over the years. I'm not very good at it, but I know how I want it to be. I know how it should be. Do you have citrus? Can you keep citrus where you live? I always said I would never grow citrus in Britain because it's not the place that it should be. But somebody gave me a lemon and I keep it in a greenhouse in the winter and um, in the summer it's outside and it's fairly happy. It's fairly happy. I do get lemons from it. The best thing to have in a climate like this is a bitter orange. They're the most resilient. And that's really what I would probably grow if I was making a choice about citrus. But I didn't make a choice. I was given this lemon. So there we are. That's beautiful. I mean, I love the part in your book where you talk about the respect that comes with eating citrus when you are visiting these Italian growers and how you don't eat the oranges in the fields and your first experience eating a bitter lemon as a thief. When you say that you would never grow citrus in Britain, is that out of respect for the fact that you think it needs to be grown in Italy or is it just a classic climate? issue? I, a lot of people do grow ornamental citrus in England, but it's very prone to disease here. It's very prone to all kinds of different diseases associated with being too damp, really. And so I would rather not, not be around it here. But on the other hand, something that I do always in Italy is when I'm among citrus trees, I always take a leaf and pinch it to smell the... You can almost tell what kind of tree it is from that alone. Actually, you smell the fruit in the, in the, the smell of the leaf because there's so many essential oils in both the fruit and the, and the leaf. And so I like that. I, you know, I do that occasionally with my poor little lemon. 
you know, it's only two feet high. It's time for fall planting and feeding plant friends, and you should be doing this with Espoma Organics, my favorite family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. Whether you're planting for fall or for any season, when you are starting your plants, I highly recommend starting your plants with their Biotone Starter Plus. It's the ultimate starter plant food. It's rich with a blend of the finest natural and organic ingredients and enhanced with beneficial microbes. Humates and mycorrhizae, which help the plants establish fast, grow deeper roots, and bigger blooms. So you're going to start with that Biotone Starter Plus. It's got no sludges, no fillers. And then once the plants are established, you can follow up feeding them with Espoma's line of fertilizers that they called tones. But the tones are all specifically created for whatever plant you are fertilizing. So they have a garden tone, a holly tone, a flower tone, a plant tone, a rose tone, a berry tone, a bulb tone. They've got a tone for whatever you're growing. So go check it out. Their consistency is always on point because they have a state-of-the-art solar-powered manufacturing facility, and they're the greatest. We love Espoma. They're one of my long-standing partners of this podcast, and all my plants are potted in Espoma potting mix. To learn more about all of the amazing offerings they have for you indoor and outdoor gardens, visit Espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are. Or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of Espoma products that I love. Thanks again for supporting the show, Espoma. Tis the season for fall weddings, plan friends, and I cannot think of a more unique, a more delightful wedding, birthday, or anniversary gift than a Wind River wind chime. You can even get your December holiday orders in early and save yourself the holiday shopping stress. Wind River Chimes will deliver the most magical, most thoughtful, personalized gift straight to your door. Forget the crowds at the mall. When you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout with them, you can get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime, so you can personalize it with a wedding date, an anniversary date, or a special message. For over 35 years, Wind River Chimes has been passionately pursuing harmony by delivering wind chimes that help create a peaceful, soothing, restful environment. Mama Fiella recently visited my house and would not stop talking about the wind chimes magical tones that wafted throughout our house all day. She requested one for Christmas. <laughs> A Wind River Chime is the perfect gift because every time the recipient hears the gorgeous chime singing in the wind, they will think of you and be gifted a moment of calm. Plus, when you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout, you can get a free engraving on any engravable chime. So head over to windriverchimes.com, listen to all of the different melodious options, pick from a variety of gorgeous colors, and use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout at windriverchimes.com for your free engraving to create the most special gift for your most special someone. I tried growing citrus indoors my first year caring for plants in New York City and I got a lot of spider mites. I did grow some limes. I did grow some lemons, but I've rehomed my citrus plants with my mom who's in Florida. But there's also a whole thing with Floridian citrus. But anyway, okay, you've spent 40 years examining Italians and their gardens. And I'm curious what common themes have shown up in all of the gardens that you visited in terms of a cultural connection to gardening? The Italian garden designers were at the cutting edge of garden design, as mm -hmm. you know. They, the very first modern garden, Renaissance garden, was made in Rome. Sorry, what am I saying? It so wasn't Rome. It was Fiesole <laughs> outside Florence in the 15th century by one of the Medici. And it was modern in the sense that it was ornamental. It was a very architectural design on a steep site. And it kicked off a revolution in garden design in Italy that then made Italian gardens the blueprint for fashionable gardens all over Europe. And that continued to be the case throughout the 16th century. But And in the 17th century, there's tremendous garden culture in Italy. And it's really the 17th century that got me fascinated by gardens in Italy. But they were such multifaceted places. They were places where you grew very, very valuable exotic plants, very often bulbs that you'd imported from the sort of places that Jesuit missionaries were going and they would bring them back. And these were things that were so valuable that you had to lock them up in a walled garden. 
and at night that garden needed to be guarded by a dog. But it was also a space for dancing, for concerts, for games. They called horse ballet, which we would, equestrian ballet, we would call it dressage in Britain. There Mm -hmm. were wonderful hydraulic and pneumatic devices. So there were figures that moved, little clothed figures that might, a little man might put a pipe to raise his arms, put a pipe to his lips, and air would be driven through his lips by water pressure, be a pneumatic device, so his little pipe would play. Or there might be a fountain with little bronze birds who all have pipes in their throats and the air goes through the pipes and makes roughly the sound that those birds make in real life. Or there were jockey d'aqua water tricks, which if you were a visitor of a garden and you trod on a certain paving slab or sat in a certain seat, it would trigger these great jets of water that would then soak you. And there was a whole culture around that. Who was the target of these water tricks? Never important visitors. Always, if you read 17th century treaties about gardens, it's always the servants or the youngest son or the daughters or the nursemaids. You know, it's unimportant people who are the target of these jokes. And that was all going on in the 17th century. But very gradually, Italy gave way as the most fashionable place to France. You know, Versailles became the model for gardens, a much sort of a very different, you know, Italian gardens, 17th century gardens were highly articulated, highly architectural spaces. And gradually taste moves for people to want landscapes. You know, they want more space. And it's a different, it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different thing. So then the fashion moved to France and then did it ever come back to Italy? No, then it went to England after France and Italy. So Italians went on having these wonderful gardens around big villas and palaces. They went on... Yes, in the 19th century, there was a sort of shift that gardening became more of a middle class hobby. There were the gardens around, you know, the big historic gardens, but there were also nursery, plant nurseries started to open up in particularly in the north of Italy, in the Veneto, that sort of area. And people began to have small gardens around their houses and it became a hobby. And then things sort of begin to move into crisis. Italy came out of the First World War very badly. And they, as all the people who were kind of servants and gardeners, moved away, got life. You know, they went off to the war and they came back and they didn't go back into those old structures, you know, that had given them employment. They, so people couldn't really get the gardeners. There was a little change in the period before the Second World War, because Mussolini, in his pre-war government, was promoting what he called Italianità, Italiness of Italy, the Italianness of Italy. And he revived everything that Italy had been very good at. I mean, the, the last book I wrote was partly about Cremona violins, and he had a great exhibition in Cremona about violin making, and he got... But, you know, Stradivarius violins, all the great examples of all the great makers together and had an international show. And in Florence, there was an international show about gardens in Palazzo Pitti. And they made small versions of a lot of the great gardens. And they also showcased contemporary garden designers. Then we had the Second World War. Oh, I should say as well, he set up prizes for station gardens and balcony gardens. So again, you know, it was a sort of people getting interested in gardening again a little bit. But then we have another war and Italy comes out of the war and landscape architecture is removed from university syllabuses. If you want to study garden design in Italy after Second World War, you have to go to Germany or, I mean, some of the great designers came to Britain and studied with our Russell Page, people like that, would in a very informal way 
train people to build gardens. So what you have in the 20th century is the situation that I found when Alex and I first went to look at gardens, that people, with some exceptions, obviously, some wonderful exceptions, but culturally, people weren't really either looking after the big historic gardens or gardening their own patches. They were brilliant vegetable gardens, but and you know, lots of begonias in town centres and things, but not nothing like they'd lost that great culture. And then in the last in the time that I've been involved since the late eighties, I mean I I started taking groups and very often Americans actually in those groups, sometimes purely American groups, to Italian gardens. And this was part of a a process that has really led to a revival in Italy. There's a an organization called Grandi Giardini, which was set up by an English woman who's lived in Italy all her married life. And she gave people the idea that they could maintain their gardens by earning from them, by opening them to the public and having groups and yeah. giving groups lunches and having plays and really reviving that Italian tradition of using gardens as a setting for all sorts of lovely different kinds of entertainment. And so what I've seen over the last few decades is the gardens coming back and you get the historic gardens are looking great and people are gardening as well. People are gardening now. There are garden shows. The garden shows, and I think this is the same in Britain as well, but it always makes me laugh. In Italy, there's always a stall, an Austrian stall with the special clothes that you need to wear to garden. So it's still quite a sort of fashionable thing to do in Italy. And it's very exciting mm -hmm. that, that should be the case. And of course, Italy's got some of the best nurseries in Europe especially for trees. They've got amazing nurseries around Luca and Pistoia in Tuscany. So it's come back to being a centre for gardening after that long, very rocky history. It's interesting because, so I'm Italian-American. My grandparents are immigrants from Friuli. And I think about how much of their lives revolved around their vegetable garden. Is there a separate? And so I think when I'm thinking of gardening and my Italian heritage, I'm thinking of the importance of your vegetable garden and growing all the food. I mean, my grandma would, you know, smuggle seeds in her bra. She'd sow seeds into her bra when she came home to be able to grow her heirloom tomatoes and, and stuff. You know, it's interesting, this very high class architectural, I mean, the bird, I'm like, I want that bird feature that you were just talking about with the birds singing, whistling in the water fountain. Can you speak to the lower class, the middle class Italian connection to growing their own food? I would say that's never gone. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. fantastic. The orto is the most beautiful, or well, for me, it's as beautiful as an ornamental garden. I mean, I've just had an Italian friend from Tuscany staying and <laughs> she was looking at our zucchini and saying, look, you've got the flowers still. It's so dry in Italy this summer. It's been so hot. It's been so dry that I'm sure, I mean, she certainly said they're really struggling. Their, their zucchini never grow bigger than that. They're tiny and they can never get the flowers because mm -hmm. they dry up and they like to, of course, cook them. So that's very disappointing. But I think the tradition of vegetable growing has never gone. Although, of course, a lot of people after the Second World War, left the countryside and moved into the city. And that would have changed things. That would have changed things. But it's a strong tradition. And do you think that has to do with the importance of food in Italian culture? Is it the structure of the cities where everyone had to grow their own food because it was harder to get to a grocery store? I mean, I know in my mountain town that I'm from, that's definitely everybody grew their own food because there's like one grocery store nearby. Any insights there? Well, my only thought is that the Industrial Revolution came to Italy later than it did to this country. So in Britain, people left the land very much sooner than they did in Italy. And I think those rural 
traditions survived for very much longer. And I think that that makes a huge difference. I also wanted to ask you, I took a soil science class a couple of years ago, and they talked about the quality of the soil in Italy is so much higher due to volcanic ash. Have you ever heard that in some areas? Well, that would only be in Sicily. I mean, or around Naples, because we've got Vesuvius and Etna. And certainly being in the proximity of a live volcano, particularly Etna, because Etna is constantly active. And the ash that it throws out, if it's just a a sort of dusting of ash, kind of 0.1 of a centimetre maybe, within weeks it starts to release minerals into the soil that are incredibly good for plants. So that's certainly true there. I mean, the whole of Italy has the Apennines that go down the middle and it has these huge faults. So it is very prone to earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And I suppose historically, there have probably been volcanoes will have elsewhere, which will have historically enriched the soil. Yeah, I love that. Okay, Italians and Citrus, this amazing book you wrote. Well, first off, what piqued your interest specifically about citrus? Was it just a common thread you noticed, the potted citrus in all the gardens you were visiting? What inspired an entire book on this very specific topic? I noticed not just that there were pots of citrus, but when I looked at them closely, some of the little trees in pots would have three different kinds of citrus fruit on them. They might have an orange Mm -hmm. and a lemon and a lemon shaped like praying hands or an orange that was striped green and orange. Or I thought that was very extraordinary. And I was very interested in, as I said, in 17th century gardens. And I, so I pursued this a little bit because many of the collections were very old. And I mean, ancient, you know, hundreds mm-hmm. of years old. And I discovered that the citrus collections belong to the outdoor part of those collections of curiosities, which were 18th century museums, very early museums, private museums that people had. And it struck me that they had a much bigger cultural role than just being ornamental. And that's what started my interest. And I began to take a particular interest in citrus wherever I went. And I think the starting point for me was I heard I have written about it in The Land Where Lemons Grow. I heard about this collection of citrus models that the Medici, that had been made of the Medici citrus collection in Florence. And I heard that they'd been lost for hundreds of years and recently rediscovered. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to go and try and see them. And that was, that marked the beginning, really, of writing the book. But I had no idea when I started um, what a a huge story it would be. You know, I didn't know that it would involve politics. And I suppose I might have guessed it would involve economics at some level, but not to the extent it did. Obviously, it was going to be food, but I didn't know how much medicine there'd be in there, how much art, how much poetry, and how much just plodding around in muddy fields with old men slicing up oranges and giving me little bits to taste and things I'd do. It took me to some really extraordinary corners of Italy, places I hadn't known. You know, my Italian's pretty good, but when you're talking the combination of technical language and dialect, (laughs) so, you know, somebody's talking to you more or less in dialect about how they graft a fruit tree. And you're you're kind of, oh. <laughs> Even just the North versus the South, you know, my mom's family is from the North and I consider myself Northern Italian because that's where I grew up going and we speak for long. My dad's family is from the South. And whenever my mom said she would try and speak with my dad's father, she could barely understand what he was saying. Like the dialects and the, the accents are even so different in the span of the country. I'm Dr. Laurie Santos, host of the Happiness Lab podcast. 
making new friends and maintaining old friendships is a great way to boost your happiness. There are lots of sources of well-being standing around you. You just have to tap into them. But sadly, we don't always feel up for being sociable. If I was approaching a stranger, my heart would raise. I'd feel like I was going to throw up. I just had so much anxiety around it. So in a new season of the show, I'll tackle how to make firm friendships firmer, right through to the joy you can find in talking to total strangers. I'm very much enjoying your animal print scarf, madam. You look wonderful. The steps to becoming more social might surprise you. But trust me, there are things you can introduce into your daily routine right away. I adore your purple hair, madam. It pops. So listen to The Happiness Lab on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your shows. Plant friends, I just returned from the most amazing vacation in Italy, and particularly what made it so amazing is the work that I did before I left to refresh my Italian with Rosetta Stone. I've been prepping for this trip to Italy for the last several months with daily doses of Rosetta Stone on their easy-to-use platform and app. It makes learning a language or refreshing a language so easy, and I had so much fun while doing it. It was a great way to wake my brain up in the morning. If you have international travel coming up, I gotta tell you, knowing the basics of the local language helps so much much. When we were in Italy, we were able to avoid the tourist traps and we were able to really plug into the culture, right? That's why you travel internationally. If you've had learning a language on your bucket list, Rosetta Stone has been the expert in language learning for 30 years. They've helped millions of people build the fluency and confidence to speak new languages through immersion. It even has this cool speech recognition feature, which actually tracks how you're pronouncing the language and gives you feedback on how to pronounce it with a more authentic accent. Whether you want to refresh a language skill you learned a while ago, like like I did. Maybe you want to learn a new language to get the most out of your travel. Rosetta Stone can help get you there. They have 25 languages to choose from and a lifetime membership. So I learned Italian this year, but because I have the lifetime membership, I can learn Spanish or Chinese next year or in 10 years. And they're giving you an insane discount. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a limited time, Growing Joy listeners get 50% off Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Plan friend, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash today. That's rosetta, R-O-S-E-T-T-A, stone.com slash today. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There. I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test. Because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Okay, so yes, this history of citrus woven throughout Italy, can you speak to how shockingly important it is? Maybe what shocked you the most? Maybe the economics and and how much of the economy was deeply rooted in citrus? 
I think the thing that shocked me most was the mid 19th century, around about the time that Italy was unified into a single country. Before that, it had been ruled by lots of independent princes and dukes and foreign rulers from all over Europe. It was finally unified. And that coincided with a moment in which growing oranges on the plain outside Palermo was the most lucrative kind of agriculture in Europe. And this was partly because they were exporting oranges to America, which didn't have its own orange orange, what would you call it, culture mm. at that time. You weren't growing oranges in America in the mid-19th century. Also, um, they were also making and exporting citric acid to America. All the citric acid for America came from Sicily. So it was an incredibly lucrative business and lots and lots of people wanted to be involved in it. People came from the interior of the island and tried to buy land on the Concadoro, the which was the name, the Golden Shell, the name of that plain outside Palermo, a beautiful place. And they would be taking on little bits of land that nobody had ever thought it was worthwhile cultivating before because they were too steep or too rocky. And they'd painstakingly clear all the stone off them and build a road so you could get there, build a barn where they could keep their tools and build a wall. And actually, I said oranges, but really more specifically, most specifically, it's lemons that were making the most money. Lemons because of the citric acid, lemons exporting them too. They exported oranges and lemons, but it was lemons were the most lucrative thing. And the thing about lemons is that they're really hard to grow. Despite the fact, you know, so many people try to grow them at home, they are the trees that don't like too much sun, and yet they really don't like it when it's not sunny enough. And they're very sensitive to wind. So these people with their fields had to also build a 15-foot high wall around them to protect them from the wind and to protect them from robbers because people would steal the fruit. And... When I say people, after unification, it was regime change. They were changing from the Bourbon government, which had been there for you know hundreds of years, to a centralised state run from the mainland. And there were quite a few people just roaming about, kind of people who had dropped out of the system in a way. So it was it was a time when you really needed to look after whatever you owned in order not to have it stolen. Yeah. And this is the thing that fascinated me most. At about that time, you were somebody who'd maybe come from somewhere else and you'd got to the point where you'd done all that infrastructure and you'd built the wall and you'd put the door in it and had a key fitted, had a lock fitted. And a bloke at about that time would come up to see you, very sort of behaving as if he was your uncle or something. He'd say, oh... Really, really good to see new people here. Great. I mean, um, good for you. I wonder what I can do to help you. Well, you're going to need a definitely, I see you've got somebody to work during the day, but you'll need a night watchman, that's for sure, because it's not safe. And funnily enough, I know exactly the bloke who would do that job. Just, I'll introduce you. And then he might say, don't bother to build, uh, dig a well. So expensive. We've got more money, more water than we know what to do with. Um, we'll supply your water. I don't know. You're going to need a guard dog. I've got a litter of puppies. You say yes to any of these things. And this is the proto-mafia. This is the beginning of the mafia in Sicily. So that's the beginning of the mafia all over the world. You say yes to any of it and you're hooked. You're in the system. He is controlling your water supply. When you have a drought, he'll put the price up. If you don't pay, he'll cut it off when your investment's gone. Now, you imagine people who, it's seven years after you plant citrus before you start making anything from the fruit. So they've got this huge investment and they're very paranoid. Somebody says to them, if you don't have a night watchman, somebody might come vandalise your trees. You're going to get a night watchman. So it was a very effective way of starting 
various rackets, really. Intimidation, um, they were fixing the prices of fruit on the market. They owned the dockers in the docks. So those lemons and oranges going off to America, if you didn't pay what we now call the pizza, the little protection money, your fruit would never find its way onto a ship. It would just rot on the docks. And so that, I think, really fascinated me. The idea that, if you like, lemons are to blame for the for criminal organisations, for organised crime, that has really dogged us, you know, it's dogged yeah. Sicily and so on for ever since. It's so interesting. Mostly my podcast is about houseplants and some gardening. And especially in 2020, when the rise of houseplants got really popular, there was all sorts of plant poaching and nurseries getting, you know, held up at gunpoint for expensive plants and botanical gardens getting robbed at night. You do not think about plants as being part of the black market or part of illegal trading. And it's so prevalent in the States and around the world. I mean, people going into the tropics and stealing, you know, very rare plants, which is why plants are becoming extinct. But that was very fascinating for sure. What about uh, the story of the scurvy with the blood oranges? When I read that chapter about blood oranges, now whenever I see a blood orange, I try and grab it or I try and get the, the nectar for how potent it is. I didn't know that before I read your book. Blood oranges are extraordinarily, powerfully, potently antioxidant. And I can't list all the health benefits, but they've been proven. They, they're they very good for um, respiratory conditions as well. There was a, an experiment done on traffic police in some very, very busy place. I think it was Catania in Sicily. And the extent to which the people who were having blood orange juice versus the people who were having blonde orange juice were able to cope with the carbon, the um, pollution in the air of doing that job. This is, sounds like a bit of a weird experiment, but it was um, done by the Citrus Research Centre in Catania. So it was a serious scientific mm-hmm. paper came out of it. They've also tested the same thing with blood orange versus blonde orange as drinks to give to mice to do with testing resistance to obesity of all things and how the mice that were having the blood orange juice didn't go through the sort of gene mutation which means that obesity is a condition that's passed on in families so they are extraordinary fruit and it's all down to that red pigment which is not actually a pigment it's something called an anthocyanin which is the thing that gives all super fruits their quality and these well these qualities if you like scurvy which was the scourge of sailors on long boat journeys on long sea journeys was cured by lemon juice in fact, lemon juice is incredibly rich in vitamin C. And sailors, if you look into it, sailors knew this for hundreds of years before it was made official. They had been treating each other with lemon juice. But once it was made official, it was a British yeah. scientist who made this official. And then Sicily again became the sole supplier of lemon juice to the British Navy all over the world, which was another huge strand of income for those Sicilian lemon farmers. But just that those soldiers were basically prescribed lemon juice to avoid the scurvy. It's it's incredible. Yeah, your book is so fascinating. I highly recommend everyone read it if any of this interests you. I'm dying to know, what are your favorite gardens to visit in Italy? Can you pick I'm sure it's like picking your favorite child, but, you know, if I was to ask the top five. You'd probably go to San Giuliano in Sicily, which is a 20th century garden made by Marchese di San Giuliano, who's sadly passed away, working, collaborating with a British gardener called Rachel Lamb. And they've made a a garden that's really rich in succulents, cacti, trees, 
and all sorts of fascinating plants. When we're talking about historic gardens, I love Villa Lante in Lazio on the rare occasions when it's not full of crowds. You can get there, you can go there in winter. Mm. Go to Villa Lante on a really bright day in winter and get the full effect of the sun and the shade and the light on the water and the different sounds the water makes as it goes through different channels in the garden. I think that's a wonderful experience. And of course, I love the Boboli Gardens in Florence because they have a wonderful citrus collection. And so it goes on. Boboli Gardens is where the Medici collection is? The Boboli, the Castello, the Medici House Castello, also outside Florence, has what remains of the Medici collection. And that's so well worth going to for citrus, sort of more than the... I mean, the garden's amazing. It's got a grotto in it full of beautifully carved animals made out of different kinds of stone. I mean, what more do you want, really? Wow. Right. I love it. San Giuliano, Villa Lante, and the Boboli Gardens. Anything else? And Castello. Villa Medici di Castello. And Castello. Yeah, that's beautiful. To wrap up, well, first off, I know you're writing your next book. What are we allowed to know what it's on? Well, I'll tell you that it's about Sicily in some respect. I think it's going to be the same mix of people and food and landscape and plants and history as lemons in a way. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. If you were to leave with a piece of advice for my hobby gardener audience, you know, we're houseplant hobbyists, we're gardener hobbyists growing our own food, maybe some ornamentals. What would be one way to elevate our gardens in an Italian way that you would suggest? Well, I suppose having some sort of symmetry to the design, because that's the historic gardens were very architectural, very symmetrical. So rather than having beds with sort of island beds with wavy edges to have square beds, rather than having one, having two of the same size, there's a thought, lots of pots, lots of water, if you can manage that. Yeah, lots of terracotta. Lots of terracotta. Yeah. Lots of statues. I love it. Well, where can everyone find you and your books? And are you on social media? Where can people find you and follow you? I'm on Instagram. I ha- and I also have a website. It's helena-atley.com is my website. And Helena Atley on Instagram. Perfect. Well, mille grazie, Helena. Prego. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Helena, for joining us today. She's such a special lady. I can't tell you, Plant Friends, this interview is so special for me because I read her book multiple years ago. I always recommend it. It was this big moment for me, this big aha moment of how deeply my connection to plants is beyond my 500 square foot apartment in New York City at the time. That's where I was living when I read this book. You know that this connection for me is in my lineage. So if you are an Italian-American celebrating Italian Heritage Month. And if you aren't, I hope that you've loved this kind of historical exploration of Italy. It's a beautiful country. I highly recommend visiting. Obviously, plants and delicious food are the pillars of the culture. So who doesn't love that? And if you have a specific type of heritage that you would like me to explore, my inbox is always open. You can email me at maria at growingjoywithmaria.com with suggestions for who you'd want me to interview. Once again, like I said, I'll be in Italy for the next two weeks exploring. So you can follow me at Growing Joy with Maria on Instagram and TikTok to see what Italian planty things we're up to. Thank you again to our episode sponsors. Thanks to my plant friends in the Growing Joy Garden Society. That's my online private community of plant friends. If you're interested in joining us and supporting the show through your subscription, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com. Okay, plant friends, I gotta go on vacation. So until next time, I hope you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plan friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? 
Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. 
After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 